So we're looking this morning at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, starting in verse 13. And we're talking with two of Jesus' followers. They're on their road to the village of Emmaus. It's about a day's travel. It's two hours travel, actually, seven miles. And they're walking along. Jesus appears to them. Some of his followers believe at this point. Some of them seem like Cleopas and this other one he's with that they don't. And Jesus appears to them and he's hidden or God has hidden his identity. So they don't see him. They don't know. We're look now in verse 17. He asked them, this is Jesus, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? And they stopped short and there was sadness on their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, answered, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. What things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who would come to rescue Israel. And this all happened just three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning. And they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing. And they had seen angels who told them, Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to sea. And sure enough, his body was gone. Just as the women had said. And now I was noticing a few things here. Cleopas, everything he says is in the past tense. He was a prophet. He was a mighty teacher. He did powerful miracles. We hoped he was the Messiah. And it really sounds like Cleopas and this other person could have been a husband, or I mean, it could have been a wife, not a husband. He was the husband, if it seems. And Seems like they lost hope. Seems like they're giving up. They're going back to whatever life they knew before. And I see this as Jesus the shepherd going after his sheep that are wandering away. And Cleopas hears the report of Mary Magdalene. Here's the report of these others. And even the sign of the empty tomb and the missing body of Jesus didn't excite them. Didn't give them any hope. Instead, they heard those reports and they saw what others were thinking. And, and I believe John really believed that's what he says. Now, some of this, I wonder if it isn't happening even as they're walking down the road. Who knows? But these two decided to head home. Verse 25, then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? And then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And I don't think this was the first time he'd ever taught this. You can tell that God is keeping Jesus' identity hidden from their minds here. It's one thing not to recognize someone on the road. I have bumped into people in Walmart. Or I've driven by them in the car and did not recognize them. And that happens. There are things in this world that we will not see. These people are burdened with their grief. They're feeling like we've got to go back and start our lives over. Jesus died. There is no hope. And it's easy for them not to recognize him that way. But now he starts teaching. Now, what was he known for? He was the teacher. What would Mary Magdalene say when she first saw him? Rabboni, teacher. And he's teaching. And how many times did they hear him teach? How many times did they hear him speak? How many times did they hear his voice and the way he spoke? And that's what they love to hear. And yet this time they walk with him and they don't recognize him. They hear his voice and they don't recognize him. And I really think God is teaching them a lesson from this. He's giving them an example of how important it is to have the power of God when you're teaching the gospel. They knew these scriptures. They knew Jesus had taught these scriptures. 
He taught them again and again during their ministry. How many times do, did he quote the right sayings of the prophets, the words of Moses, the prophecies about himself dying and raising again? He said all these things. This is not new. This is not the first time they've ever heard them. And I'm sure Jesus had a way of putting them together like no other teacher ever had. And this should have, you're Jesus. And here we are not believing in you. But they didn't. They keep walking. And I'm sure they're sad. And they're, and, and they're hearing these words. And oh, that's so good. That's true. Yes, that's right. He said these things to us. But, and they just, they keep walking. They don't see him. They, God kept their hearts from seeing him. <clears throat> Jesus starts with the basics. Every prophecy from the beginning of the scriptures to every promise found in the prophets all the way up to Malachi. Even the ones that they struggled with, like Isaiah 53. I have to think he would have recited Isaiah 53 to them. Don't you remember how it says he'll be rejected? He'll be despised. He... He will not be anything that people will see beauty in. And then he's going to suffer and he's going to die. He'll be rejected and cut off. And all these things, they're written right there. And I'm sure Jesus had probably taught from these before. And this is everything they had witnessed and heard about. And they had just repeated these events to Jesus. And I have to think, they're not seeing the connection because God is keeping it from them. And Jesus gives the whole story of the, of the word of God, what the real story is. It's the story of himself. It's the story of God's plan and the promise and the signs to look for and then ultimately him coming. And right up to his death and resurrection is all prophesied. There's nothing there. There's even a prophecy by David that Jesus would not remain in the grave. He would not see corruption, meaning his body would not rot, is what that literally means. And yet, they were as blind to the one speaking to them as every one of the unbelieving Jews and unbelieving religious leaders that Jesus had taught. And I think God is really giving them an understanding of what the ones that crucified Jesus, what the ones who rejected Jesus, the ones who were too busy, the ones who said, crucify him, had in their hearts. They had heard the same gospel. They had seen the same miracles. They knew the same truth. And yet they could say, get rid of them. We don't want them. Take them away. And I think this is really God letting them see what it really meant to have ears that could not hear, eyes that could not see, and hearts that could not believe. I think God really did this for a reason. He wanted to show them how it could be so easy to miss the clear evidence of the gospel. And the two of them, this is the amazing thing, the two of them were believers. They were followers. They were ones that had, sounds like, given up everything, left their home to follow Jesus. And here he's teaching, and they don't see him. They're not recognizing the one who's speaking, even though he's speaking the same truth that Jesus had always done in the way that Jesus did, with the voice that Jesus did. Everything should have been there. But there was that covering. Paul talks about having your heart circumcised and having that covering ripped away to show and allow God to move and come in. When we get to verse 28, by this time they were nearing Emmaus at, and at the end of their journey, Jesus acted as if he was going to keep going. And commentaries will tell you that this was about a two-hour walk. They had started in the afternoon. It's getting on towards evening now. It's getting on towards dark. They're hungry probably thirsty, thinking this is, maybe they were at their home is what it sounds like. And if you think about it, they had had almost a two-hour lesson from Jesus. And I'm sure he answered questions. And, and there were things that he brought to light that were there for them to hear. And still their eyes were blinded. 
Still, they were not seeing. But they begged him, stay with us since it's getting late. So he, came, he went home with them and they sat down to eat. He took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he, he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And right there, even if you don't see the truth of the gospel, even if you are not a believer, there is power in the words, power in the scripture. Their hearts were burning, were yelling at them the whole time. This is the truth. This is it. This is Jesus. This is God. This is the, everything you need. And they were blinded to it because God had kept them there. They were focused on their grief. They were focused on everything, his death, and, and now he's gone, and what are we going to do with our lives? And they were missing what he was teaching. They were missing what their hearts were saying to them the whole time. <clears throat> and I would have to think, they had seen Jesus do this exact prayer and the breaking of the bread. I, I imagine maybe there was a way he did it. Maybe there was a way he held the bread as he prayed over it. Whatever it was, that that is what opened their eyes. That's Jesus. That's the way he prays when he breaks the bread. That's the way he tears the bread. That their eyes were suddenly opened. They suddenly saw and they believed. Now we see other times that are recorded when Jesus took a little bit of bread the five loaves and the two fishes at one time that he fed 5,000. And there's another time he fed, I think, 7,000. And there were just a few loaves of bread. And he blessed the bread is what it says. And then he broke it. And what we see is thousands were fed. And even after thousands had eaten until they could eat no more, they were full. They're not, there was no more bread going around and people going, I'll take that. People, oh, I'm full. Uh, no, but Matthew, Mark, John, you, you can keep going with that. Uh, Peter, I'm sorry, I can't eat another bite. I'm full. The whole crowd, all of them were full and then they collected it and there were baskets full where there'd only been just enough for a little boy's lunch to start with. And I think... Then they finally understood as Jesus tore the loaf the same way he had done, the same way he had blessed it. And I have to think, I, I had to just come to it, that maybe the words of Jesus came to them that I am the bread of life. That he is the one. And, and remember how Satan used Jesus' hunger to tempt him into turning stones into bread. And Jesus' answer was, no, no. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's a quote. I had to look that up. It's Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 and 3. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character, to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And that was the symbolism in Jesus breaking the bread, saying, I am the bread of life. The manna, we're told in the New Testament, that's angel's food. That's the food that God feeds angels with. I didn't know angels had to eat, but apparently they eat it. And this bread symbolized, and the way Israel depended on them, they needed bread every day. You know the, the, the way they went out in the morning, and, and those who gathered a little got enough to eat. Those who brought a whole bunch back, they didn't have any extra. It's one of those amazing things, except for the one day a week they weren't to go gathering. And if you tried to save some from one day to the next day, it would stink and grow worms. You needed a fresh supply every day, and that's what Jesus was teaching them. You need me every day. I am the bread of life. There were people who followed Jesus simply because he fed them bread. 
And he was like, I have something more for your heart, for your soul. It's the words of God, the words that I speak. You, want, you think of a loaf of bread and your hunger physically. I'm here to satisfy you spiritually. I am the bread of life and I am here to feed you. And that is what he'd done for these two. He had joined them on the road. He had walked with them. And he'd been feeding them spiritually with the words from the prophets, with the words from Moses, with the truth that they needed because they had a hunger. But it wasn't the stomach hunger. It was Jesus is gone. Our world has ended. What are we going to do? I guess we have to go home and start over. I mean, Peter and, and John and Mary, they're talking about things we don't understand. He's dead. He's gone. He can't be the Messiah. It's over. And Jesus comes here to, I am the bread of life. You're missing the point. And he teaches them all of it over again. And their heart burning within them, that is the bread feeding them. That's the bread we want. When you read the Bible, when you read God's word, it's something within you is, oh, I never saw that before. That's when the Spirit feeds you. That's when Jesus is your bread of life. That's when he's feeding you spiritually, feeding your soul. And Jesus had spent that journey feeding them the words of God. But they were focused on their grief. And then they came into the house and they're focused on putting on a meal for Jesus. For the stranger, they didn't know it was Jesus. They're focused on getting a meal. What do we have? Oh, I got this loaf of bread. We got some water. Well, at least we can give the man something before he heads on out of here. This, this great teacher, he, he sounds like Jesus. But he's really good. I'm glad he stayed in our house for the night. <laughs> they, they're missing what it is. And they're focused on their own hunger until Jesus speaks the words of God and asks the blessing. And then they realize the truth. And just as he revealed himself in this way, God finally allowed them to fully understand what their hearts had been shouting at them this whole journey. And just as quickly as they recognized him, I'm sure it was one of these, they wanted to jump up and grab him and hug him and hold on to them. And he's gone. Verse 33, and within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, the Lord has risen, has really risen. He appeared to Peter. I imagine they ate that bread that Jesus had blessed and broken. And then I think they ran back to Jerusalem. I was reading one thing and, and they were saying, well, it was a two hour walk. So they walked for two hours. They sat there for an hour, and I'm like, it says within the hour. I don't think it says they stayed there for an hour. I don't think they had much appetite at that point. And I don't think it took them two hours to get back to Jerusalem either. I think that's the fastest seven miles they ever covered in their lives. They had seen Jesus, and they wanted to go tell people. And when they got back, they were given the news that Jesus hadn't just appeared to them. He had appeared to Peter. Jesus is here, there, and everywhere right now. He's bringing his flock back together. The ones, as the scripture said, I'm going to smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. They're scattered. There's groups of them together, but we find out later on Thomas isn't there. Thomas doesn't believe for another week. Thomas goes for a whole week going, yeah, yeah, you guys saw that. I don't believe you. And here's Cleopas and, and his partner that Jesus had to chase them all the way down to their home to get them to understand. And Peter, he had to go find him. I don't think Peter was too busy showing his face around everybody else. I think maybe he was, he knew how he had betrayed Jesus, how he had con sworn he didn't know him. And I don't think he felt like really being the leader of the disciples at this point. But Jesus came to him and restored him. Jesus has appeared to Peter. There's incredible news. And he's revealing them, himself to them as he really is, not as they imagined he should be. Their ideas about who and what the Messiah were were not what Jesus was. They were expecting him to be a king. They were expecting at some point he's going to say, 
I am the king. Bow down to me, and we're going to go against the Romans. And this is not how he appeared to them. And now they're understanding. They didn't see him as the sacrifice for sin. And now it's starting to come to their understanding of who he really is. And a complete understanding that they did not have before. In the verse 35, then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. And just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. He's suddenly standing in the middle of the room, in the middle of the group. Imagine telling the story, and we get to the point, he, he, he took the bread. And just as he held it up, I was thinking, doesn't that look like the way Jesus held the bread? And then he began to speak, and he spoke a blessing, and isn't that the words that Jesus would use? And then he broke the bread, and I thought, that's the way Jesus broke the bread. And it was Jesus! And suddenly, he's right there next to you. <laughs> suddenly, it's Jesus! Whoa, he's here! Look at that! Imagine how they felt, and, and what we're told is, Jesus was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. This is just like when the angels appear. What's the first thing they have to say? Don't be afraid. I'm here from God to tell you something. Fear not. Jesus has to start the same way. Peace be with you. But the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. He says, why are you frightened? Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see it's really me. Touch me. Make sure that I'm not a ghost. If you really think I'm dead and I can never be here with you again, find out I'm real. Touch me. Because ghosts don't have bodies as you see that I do. As he spoke, he showed them his hands. He showed them his feet. And still they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. Then he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of boiled fish, and he ate it as they watched. Then he said, when I was with you before, I told you everything written about me in the law of Moses, and the prophets, and in the Psalms. And it must be fulfilled. In verse 45, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. This is an interesting thing. Jesus had been their teacher for years. This is the fourth Passover that is mentioned during the time of his ministry that they had just come through. Three years he had been teaching them. And they got it, but they didn't get it. And here we see, this is the point. Every teacher knows this point. You can teach a student and show them on the board and write it on the paper and give them, but until their mind gets it, <laughs> they don't really get what you're teaching. That's the point. And now Jesus, now at this point, it says he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Now this shows the work of the Spirit. This shows the power of God. This isn't just words being spoken. He's not just drawing diagrams on the page. and He's opening their minds to give them understanding that can only come from God. He's being the bread of God, the bread of life. Because <laughs> up until then, they're afraid, they're startled, they're frightened. They were so sure he's no longer living that they refused to believe he's standing there among them. I mean, Cleopas telling the story. Whoa! Who are you? <laughs> he just saw Jesus and believed. And now he's like, you're a ghost. Now Jesus had picked up the bread and broken it in his own house. And yet now the rest of them are going, it's a ghost. And Jesus says, come here and touch me. Look at the scars in my hands. You see my feet. See those? Those are from the nails from the cross. I'm real. Believe. 
They touched him and found he was just as real as he was before. And then he went and ate something to prove he had a body, prove he wasn't a ghost. And he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. The greatest thing he could do, the real evidence of his power. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sin for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as your father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with the power from heaven. They now fully believed. They now understood that Jesus was God. All those things that he taught. All those things that Cleopas and the other man or woman that was walking with him heard and their hearts burned. Now they understand. Now they believe. Now there's something real to it. And they understood he is God. He said, I am the son of God. I have the power. You would recognize me if you knew my father. They now Whatever they had had, because Cleopas, it really seems like, was caught up in the Messiah, the king, not the Messiah who will die as the lamb. And finally, he gets this. And Jesus says, I've got more. You got this lesson, finally. Now there's more. You're going to go to tell the world there's forgiveness of sins for all who repent, all who believe. John the Baptist came and said, repent. And people were baptized. Jesus came and said, repent. And they did. But what they thought they were repenting for, I don't think was what Jesus was really intending in every case. And now he's come and shown them this is what the repentance is all about. And then he says, and I will send the Holy Spirit. He gives them something new. They just finally got this lesson. And now Jesus is giving them something new. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. Just as my father promised. And I'm sure that set off a whole new chain of, where's that in the scriptures? Jesus just gave us all these scriptures to prove himself. Where's the scriptures about the Holy Spirit? What does this mean? How can, what, where, how, who, what prophets wrote? And I'm sure this is all set off in their minds. But stay here in this city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with the power from heaven. He's had to go and chase down a few. He's had to go round up a few. He's had to be the shepherd, bringing the sheep back, going all the way to Emmaus, and who knows where he went for others. And he says, stay here. Stay together. Wait. It's not going to be the same as when you followed me. I'm not always going to be here. I'm not always going to be right there with you, eating and, and living and teaching and, and sleeping in the same places you sleep. But stay here, and I'm going to give you something greater. I'm going to give you the bread of life. Once again, it gets back to the bread, the, the manna that came down from heaven. That's what the Holy Spirit is to us. We don't have to be where one physical person is. That's what Jesus and his followers were. We have the Holy Spirit to feed us everywhere, the bread from heaven, every day, as we need. And that's the promise, and that's, that's what Jesus is teaching here. And he's teaching them, there's more. But wait, it gets better. It's more. He's got more in store for us if we wait on the Holy Spirit, if we trust in him, if we remain where he wants us to and go where he wants us to. We have the bread of life, and we will have that bread of life to feed us every day, all the time. Lord, we thank you for the way that you went and chased down these ones. You taught them. I wish I could hear that sermon. But Lord, we thank you so much that you gave the Holy Spirit so we don't have to be where we can hear your words. We have the word of God right here, and we can read it and be fed. And we thank you for that. Feed us, Lord. Bless us. Help us to understand and not be like these two that walked along without comprehending, without seeing you. Give us that vision. May our hearts burn within us and we be hungry for your bread from heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.